You're listening to After No War, broadcasting from the beautiful South Berlin. Set no substitute. Hello, 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 dear listeners. Welcome to Achtung Millwall. My name is Nick Hart. You're listening, of course, to the number one Millwall podcast. Now, I wasn't going to be doing another show this week. This is as I speak on Friday in the aftermath of that disappointment on, on Tuesday night. Um, but I thought we're all probably feeling a little bit like the season has got away from us, rather. I know that mathematically still... In the last six games of the season, if Mill pick up 18 points, six wins, we're possibly a rim of a shout. That's a that's a big ask. That's a tall order, isn't it, dear listeners? Um, but we, you know, we live in hope. Um, let's let's go into tomorrow's game at home to Barnsley in a position of hope. Um, but I thought it might be well just to cheer myself up. It might cheer you up, listeners. I don't know. But I thought to cheer me up, rather. I'd do a random fixture show. I haven't done one for a little while. For one reason or another, I went down with COVID um, during February. Missed a few games, um, did a few watching streams. And I must admit, I'm going to be up front with you listeners, it left me feeling a bit washed out afterwards. I really have been under, probably operating about 80% since um, February and through March, in all honesty. May as well be honest with you. you can, I, can, I can entrust my medical details to you. Listeners, we've got that relationship, that kind of setup between us, haven't we? Um, so yeah, I've been feeling a bit, a uh, bit down. I'm getting better. I'm feeling, feeling all right now. Um, so I thought it might be nice to do another random fixture show, as um, well going into the summertime. We're, we're looking at the end of the season now, probably in all realism. I saw the news yesterday that Conor Mahoney will be released at the end of the season. That's the kind of news that you put out as a football club when you are planning for the long, hot, crazy, hazy days of summer. So that's that's looming at the end of the month. It is bizarrely the cricket season. I was mad cap as it sounds, gonna go to Essex yesterday, but it was freezing wind chill. Uh, both at scale eight, I think, um, when I went out for my morning constitutional, so I gave that up. But as we're looking at the summertime, um, with myself, Neil Fissler, the chaps, we're gonna be looking at a few shows to try and keep you entertained, amused and informed. That's their mission on Achtung Mill about all things uh, Zampa Road and Cold Blow Lane over the course of the summertime. So in that spirit, I thought I'd try and get back into the, the swing of doing random fixture shows, which are often quite popular. I hope you find this um, first one in a little while um, informative. Um, now, I always choose these years. During the football season, What the way I do this is I choose a year at random, and there is a, a website called random.org, and if you put in the year as 1885 to about 2010, I normally go up to then, um, it will select a year at random. Um, now, this year, <laughs> I've selected, in, in, in the interest of cheering us all up, I've selected probably one of the more depressing years of the last 150-odd, uh, which was the year 1917, famous movie doing the rounds on, on Netflix, of course, about the First World War, 1917. Um, a momentous year in world history. But um, so anyway, so I, I was going to maybe choose another one just to, um, you know, in, in the interest of trying to keep it a little bit more upbeat. But no, I decided I'm going to run with the, the choice of the great dice god. And it's chosen 1917. So what I try and do is to find a fixture as close as possible to today's date. Today is the 8th of April, um, and I found in 1917, 8th of April, um, a Millwall versus Chelsea fixture in the, in the London combination, which I'll come back to. London combination, so this was a wartime um, football league organised mainly between the London clubs. We will come back to the London combination, so that's quite interesting in itself. But the game played with guest players under a wartime Football League, 1917, three years into the catastrophic First World War. Uh, this game finished Mill 2, Chelsea 1. I do have a report, match report, from The Athletic, which was The Athletic News, actually. Modern, not the modern day Athletic. The Athletic News. Mill versus Chelsea, big crowd and a good game, says the, the reporter here. Um, it was quite like old times at the Den on Saturday when the ground and stands were crowded 
and a fine game was provided. Chelsea played pretty football, but it was not effective, and the home side had seldom shot better. So, sounds like a good game for the Lions. Mill winning by the odd goal in three, as they put it here. You know, by, by this stage, um, you know, the, the country would have been through the initial phases of the war, 1915, 1916, Battle of the Somme, so casualties would have been heavy, and increasingly the, the weight of industry in the country was committed ever more solidly towards what modern day terms you might call total war, um, everything being organised around the struggle on the Western Front, just across the English Channel. Um, the crowd for this game, which I've looked up on Richard Lindsay's book, The uh, the Complete Record, which is a mainstay of when I do these shows, uh, was 14,000. That's unusually high for this season, which was played within this competition, the London Combination. Um, crowds, very difficult. Many men would be away in the services, uh, Royal Navy and uh, the Army. The, there was a Royal Flying Corps, I believe, at this stage, but it would have been comparatively small. So predominantly in the Army and in the Navy. Um, and obviously industry was organised around production of munitions and, and uh, supplies for the troops at the front. So a crowd of 14,000 in April 1917 was a good crowd. Local derby. Um, reading the reports, it sounds like an attractive game. Uh, when they settled down to it, the reporter says, the Lions pressed for several minutes. The opening goal for Mill via Davis, W. Davis. I think that's Wally Davis. I'm going to come back to Wally Davis. And I'm also going to come back to Joe Dines, D-I-N-E-S, who supplied the through ball. In modern money, you'd call that the assist. A capital through ball, as, he, as it's put here, um, for Davis to score a great goal. Um, the second goal in the first half was by Moody, who I know to be Herbert Moody. Um, it doesn't describe how the second goal was scored. The, the, the reportage is wordy and, um, shall we call it verbose, listeners? Why, why not? Let's call it verbose. Very much that was the style of sports reportage in these old papers. So you have to kind of read them. Even the headline, Millwall versus Chelsea, big crowd and good game. Doesn't tell you what the score was. Um, I've worked out it was 2-1. I've actually checked that score in Richard Lindsay's book. It was indeed a 2-1 win for Millwall. But the way the reporting is described, it goes around a lot of houses, not often not to tell you very much. So, so you know, at, at the first half for the Lions, we finished at the half 2-0 ahead. No idea how Moody scored his goal. Davis from a through ball from Dines, Joe Dines. Second half, Chelsea came back, it says... Um, the uh, towards the end, Chelsea made several huge efforts for an equaliser, having um, scored early via. Do, 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 don't say who scored the Chelsea goal. It's <laughs> the kind of level we're working at here. Um, so they pulled it back to two one and pressed hard towards the end for an equaliser, but no no dice. Um, the two teams, uh, Millwall in goal, J Joyce, Tiny Joyce. I'm going to mention. Tiny Joyce again. We have spoken about Tiny in the past. He was a major figure in, in Mill history, Tiny Joyce. Um, Jay Kirkwood and W. Woodley. I don't know if they were substitutions. Possible. Uh, it, possible given that these would have been guest players, I mean. Um, probably servicemen passing through London. Uh, R. Barrett, J. Wilson and J. Dines. Mention him again, Joe Dines. Um, Jane Nock without a K, N O C K, R Noble, W Davis, Wally Davis, I believe that is, H Moody, Herbert Moody, and S Lamb. Uh, the Chelsea side features a Lieutenant Bresnam uh, in, in amongst their players, which gives you some sense of um, the overwhelming nature of the First World War and its increased dominance on life in this country. The competition, which I've mentioned a couple of times, was the London Combination. Um, when war broke out, which was in August 1914, famously, um, football actually continued. There was, no con there, there was no conscription at the start of the First World War. It was a volunteer army. The initial um, expeditionary force was the existing standing army plus territorials. Um, that was very quickly, very quickly decimated in the opening battles, which were vicious and bloody and were kind of, um, I think it's fair to say the opening battles of 1914 from my reading, I don't claim to be a First World War expert, 
but the opening battles were exploratory in their nature. There was this new way of fighting warfare, the old days of moving around in, you know, um, men in bright red uniforms and marching about in lines were gone. Modern technology uh, allowed um, increased dominance of defensive trench warfare. And it took a while for, I think, probably all sides, including the German side, to find their way through this new, new method of warfare. The, the price being paid whilst these experiments were taking place was human life and blood. Um, casualties very high in the opening months. By 1916, a new army had formed up. By then, conscription had come in. This was uh, going to be Kitchener's army, which obviously met um, a, uh, it's a catastrophic, catastrophic first day on the Battle of the Somme in 1916. By the time 1917 came around, things had advanced still further. War weariness was becoming a real factor in, in many countries, um, including abroad, including in France. Um, I've diverged a little bit away from the football, haven't I, listeners? And I apologise. I, I find it's very difficult to talk about football in these war years. And this is one of the reasons why I slightly hesitated before I took on 1917, because I don't claim to be an expert on the First World War. There are many out there that um, specialise in, in that. Well, I, I've only read and listened to historians who I personally rate Max Hastings, uh, for example, but there are others about these these um, uh, awful battles of the First World War. The interesting thing with football was initially in 1914-15, it continued. There was actually a full football season played out, including an FA Cup final, to increasing, increasing criticism from the press because after these opening awful battles that I've already mentioned, it became increasingly hard to justify what became seen as an increasingly frivolous thing called football. Professional sport, cricket, rugby, but football being the sport of the people. Um, so 1914-15 actually played out with, um, in the normal way, football league season. Odd as it will, will sound, with the benefit of hindsight. From 1915 onwards, they formed a competition called in London, particularly the London Combination. This was a reduced travel um, league based around the London clubs. The initial clubs inaugurated in 1915 were Arsenal, Chelsea, Clapton Orient, Croydon Common, a team that no longer exists, Crystal Palace, Fulham, Millwall, QPR, Tottenham, Watford and West Ham. Um, after the end of the First World War, the London Combination became a reserve team um, competition it became known as the football combination, which many listeners may remember, may remember, as being um, regularly, you know, fixtures regularly published in the papers for reserve sides from particularly the, the first division sides. Um, and it carried on for some time, the football combination. Um, started in 1915 in wartime under extreme circumstances and folded in the end with the one of the impacts of the Premier League system in 2012 was that they formed their own Premier League reserve competition. That led to the end of the London stroke football combination. So this, um, we actually won it. I'm just looking at the football combination. Well, I've forgotten this. We won the football combination in 1992-93. Uh, now I read it, I remember it, but um, it's one of those things that goes out of your head. And again, 1992-93, and again, 1999-2000, we won the football combination. Who knew? I kind of knew it, but forgotten it. So anyway, back to Joseph Dines, who played in this 2-1 win over Chelsea in the London combination. Um, he's actually mentioned, the reason that his name sticks out to me is he's mentioned on what is the official club, Lewisham Council registered War Memorial. There is a plaque, which I've never seen. I've got a picture of it here from Lewisham's website, um, which is like, it looks like a small... Um, bronze plaque, Millwall Football Club, to the memory of those players who of this club who laid down their lives in the Great War, 1914 to 18. Uh, and there it is, Jay Dines alongside G. Porter, C. Green and J. Williams. Who, are, who dies if England lives is the slogan on the, on the um, plaque. Um, it would be lovely. I've never seen it. Um, I don't know where it is in the, in the, in the club. 
I think it should be something that is on display somewhere. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a big fuss about this um, because I just think it's one of those things that ought to be in or near the Garden of Remembrance. That's the, there's a little garden round by the uh, Colblow Lane End, isn't there? And I would love to see this plaque, which apparently was bought by the the, the club after the end of the of the conflict in 19, um, 1921, actually. It was the directors of the football club donated this with a bed to a local Miller Hospital. Um, it'd be great to see it on display or something of that kind to, you know, as a memorial. Um, it is listed on the Lewisham website. I've just never seen it. So maybe if anyone out there um, knows more about it, I, I don't know. It'd be great to see it. Joe Dines is named on the um, plaque. Um, he didn't play many games for us. Um, Joe's is Frank Dines. 1886 to the 27th of September 1918. He actually died in the Pas de Calais fighting in the army. September 1918, that's tragically close to the end of the conflict. What's that, just about a month, a couple of months later nearly? 11th of November 1918. Um, he was an English amateur footballer, a, a, a convinced amateur. This was a thing of the... Uh, nature of the game back then, you had this divide in cricket and, and rugby and also um, in football. A divide between professionalism and amateurism. Um, amateurism implied, obviously, that you were from a higher income bracket. Uh, professionals tended to be working men from the working classes. Um, but Joe Dines, Joseph Frank Dines, was an English amateur footballer who competed in the 1912 Summer Olympics. He was part of the Great Britain amateur football scene, which won a gold, a gold medalist. Um, he played for various clubs, uh, came from Norfolk, Kings Lynn, played for a couple of uh, Kings Lynn sides, Lynn Town, Lynn, Lynn United, guested for Norwich City, Woolwich Arsenal as a guest, QPR as a guest, um, played for Ilford, Liverpool, making one appearance for Liverpool, um, Ilford again, Walthamstow Avenue and then Millwall in 1912, and Clearly, um, during the course of the First World War, where he served in the Machine Gun Corps, um, he he would turn out for the Lions when he was around. He was killed aged 31 in Pas de Calais on the Western Front. He's buried in Agincourt um, in, in uh, northern France. Um, rest in peace, Joe Dines, Joe Dines. English amateur, 27 caps and three caps for Great Britain in the, in the Olympics. Um, so there we are. Um, other names mentioned in the course of that description. Um, jo Tiny Joyce we've mentioned. I've pulled out the, the biog from the wonderful Neil Fissler, um, Dave Sullivan and others who's who book, which is a great, great book. Um, it is on victorpublishing.co.uk. It's about 20 quid. If you want to get a book that will serve you well in your Millwall life, I recommend you get that book. Every a description of every player that's ever played for Millwall. Um, known as John William Joyce, known as Tiny on account of his size, he was a big man. Lived from 1887, 1877, sorry, to 1956. Played 385 games. Um, he was a goalkeeper. Um, description here: Tiny was the first man to sign for Millwall on set, three separate occasions, and despite his bulky frame. He was a very agile man. He won the London League with Millwall in 1904, the London Challenge Cup in 1909, and the Western League in 1908 and 1909. He also scored a football league goal for Spurs and another nine penalties in the reserves and in friendlies. He continued to serve Millwall as an assistant trainer until his retirement in May 1938 and then stayed on the ground staff while he also did some general labouring work and was a night watchman. Um, he had a brother, William, who played for Burton United. I do believe from previous shows, we have mentioned Tiny on one, you know, the Neil Fissler history shows that we did last year. Do dig those out, listeners. I might stick a link out there um, for those shows because we, we did one on Tiny Joyce. Remarkable character, big, big personality. He worked and actually helped to dig the ground at North Greenwich. Um, I think he was involved in the, um, you know, some of the hard labouring that went on to bring that ground up to scratch. Major, major figure in um, in Mill history. Born in Burton-on-Trent, 1877. He passed away in Greenwich, 1956. 385 games. Um, the other goal scorer, we had um, W. Davis, Wally Davis, who I have heard of previously. I hadn't heard of Herbert Moody, who was the scorer of the second goal 
versus uh, Chelsea in the fixture that we're looking at. Uh, so new name on me, um, inside left, 1912 to 1920 played for the Lions, 139 games, 52 goals, that's not a bad return from 139 games, scored 52 times. He lived 1880 to 1959, he was um, uh, born in Luton, died in Luton, came from Luton Town, um, signed for Mill Athletic, July 1912 and retired circa 1920. Um, Herbert Burt was a gifted player with his head and feet, winning Southern League representative honours. He played alongside the Dockers manager, Burt Lipsham, during one of his two spells with the hometown club, Luton, and joined his former Hatters teammates, Ernie Brown, Tommy Quinn and John Smith at the Den. He won the Kent Senior Shield in 1912 and 1913 and the London Challenge Cup in 1914. He played football till he was 40. Um, he was an engineering apprentice at... Um, firm called Hayward Tyler's, uh, and then he went on to work at Vauxhall Motors, where he became a foreman in the centre lave section. No glamour life in football back then, dear listeners, was there. I um, also just wanted to mention Wally Davis. Um, I think, again, we've mentioned him in some of the, the history shows. Um, Walter Otto Davis, Wally, uh, centre forward for Mill, 142 games, 91 goals, listeners, from 142 appearances. Born 1888 in Mould in Northern Wales. I know Mould. My previous uh, previous uh, girlfriends came from Mould. Um, a little while ago, hasten to add. 1888 to 1937. He um, was a diamond of a centre forward, it's described here. Not the big hulking figure you'd expect at five foot seven. Um, he came to the capital as a youngster and lived in the West Ham area and will come to the attention of Millwall. He was a Welsh international who served in the army during the Great War when he played in one game for the Lions against Clapton and scored a hat-trick wearing his army boots. I think that, I don't know if there's any documented evidence, but it's a great story. And I, as I, I think Sam Goldwyn, the American filmmaker, said, if you don't worry about the facts, just give me the story. Um, so he scored a hat-trick wearing his army boots, uh, injured in an army match, uh, ending his football career, and he later became a dock labourer. Wally died in mysterious circumstances, listeners, after being found drowned in Bow Creek in 1937. Sad. Um, just to move along, we've mentioned you, you can't describe football of this era without mentioning the First World War. The, the, the football scene at this point was, is entwined totally with the massive events going on in, on the continent and indeed around the world for that matter. Um, 1917, April, um, notable for a, a series of major events, really. Um, the Battle of Arras, um, I'm just reading from Wikipedia here, I'm not going to go too deeply into these events. Um, from April the 9th to May the 16th was a, a major offensive uh, by the British and, and Empire troops to uh, advance on the Western Front, but they were unable to achieve a breakthrough. They did advance... And notably via the Canadians at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which I think was one of the biggest explosions. I think they dug landmines out underneath the German trenches and blew them up. There's a huge crater to this day, I think, in um, Vimy, which is on the Belgian-French border. You can still go and see some of these, these places. Um, some major battles which would not achieve what was hoped. Loss of life, great on all sides. But crucially, crucially for the um, what would eventually end the war in 1918, um, two things would end the war. One was the uh, entry of the United States, which came into the conflict on the side of the Allies on April the 6th. Um, this would be a critical moment in the course of the First World War because with the entry of the United States, the material balance tipped decidedly in favour of the Allies, the British and the French. The Germans were desperately trying to uh, take Russia out of the war on their eastern front and on the April the 16th, Vladimir Lenin arrived in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, um, in events that it was, it was um, transported across uh, the German Empire via the Secret Service of Germany from Switzerland where he's in exile and he would go on to lead the Russian Revolution in October of that year. Um, 
the combination of the Russians leaving the war in late 1917 and the full weight of American armaments and men uh, arriving from 1918 in, in, in reality led the Germans to launch what would eventually be a destructive offensive in March 1918. Um, they decided to go for it with everything they had. It came close to breaking the British lines, but the line held, and then the, the Allies, it was the Allies' turn to go on the offensive, and that would finish the war in November, one year later, one and a half years later. Just looking at this copy of the Daily Mirror um, for the, the day that, in, uh, that we're talking about, April, uh, April the 9th, Monday, April the 9th, 1917. Um, pictures, there's a picture paper, the Daily Mirror, it's great. Um, two German destroyers are torpedoed, it says on the front page, April the 9th. Um, picture of an aeroplane that's crashed in a Paris street. British officers honoured by the French president. Another picture of um, some men from the um, uh, the, fort, the British Expeditionary Force um, being honoured with uh, French medals from President Poincaré. Um, and then pictures of a shattered San Quentin um, shelled to pieces, which obviously is much closer to the, the front line. Um, inside pictures of a shirt of a trench system um, which as the headline has it was once a, fr a happy French homestead and there's pictures of the zigzag trench systems and front line which would be um, known as M M Mucky Farm, Mouquet Farm um, which would be uh, on, on the western front there. Um, back page images of an Australian triumphal march into a town called Balpin, Bal Bapoma, Bapoma, my French is rusty, listeners, too rusty. And then sadly, that above a, below an a image of a rugby match at the Royal Naval Depot at Devonport, um, obituaries for three of, uh, officers for King and Country, Mr. Frank Russell, uh, Sergeant Thomas Hawkins, DCM, the Military Medal, and Lieutenant John Thwaites of the Royal Flying Corps, killed in France. Somber, somber stuff, all pinned around a football match. You can't talk about wartime football, First World War football particularly, and escape the uh, the somber events on on the uh, on the Western Front, France and Belgium. So there we are, dear listeners. I've covered a lot of ground there. I hope I haven't rambled too much. I hope you enjoy my that my ramble. If I have rambled too much, uh, Mill two. Chelsea won, goals from Davis and Moody, mention in the report for Joe Dines, who is also one of our uh, fallen, mentioned on our war memorial, and I'd love to see that war memorial placed out in the open somewhere, if it can be, or if not inside, somewhere where it can be seen. There we are. Thank you for listening to this um, random fixture from the past. I might do another one next week as the fancy takes. We're going to try and put together some uh, shows, got some ideas with Neil, um, got some ideas with some boys, looking at various things over the course of the summertime. I've got a few ideas myself to try and keep you amused. Um, and still six games of the season to go, so there's still an outside shot, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> oh dear, more, more medicine please, nurse. My, 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 I haven't had my pills yet, nurse. Thank you for listening, dear listeners. Arriva Dirty Millwall. Until the next show, bye for now. Thank you for listening to Aston Millwall. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a cheeky little review. Arriva Dirty Millwall. Till next time. Who do you want to watch?